Hello there, my name's Neil Gardner and I'm an audiobook producer, uh, narrator, I'm also edit and master. Uh, I own and run Labbrook Audio in Croydon. Hopefully some of you have come and worked with us. Uh, I also own and run Spoken World Audio, which is an independent audiobook publishing company uh, with an online presence. Uh, and uh, about two years ago I founded the Audiobook Creators Alliance. Um, who's this? This is Darwin. Um, he's quite well known around the industry as an executive producer. Uh, he's really good at his job. He keeps me in line. But I just he wanted to come and say hello. So there he is. I, I couldn't really start this without having Darwin here. So we'll let him go off and do his thing. Because uh, he's busy. He's got lots of editing to do. So thank you for joining us for this audiobook session at the One Voice Conference, which of course in these weird, difficult times is uh, online through the magic of magic things, which I don't really understand because I'm an audio person, not a visual person. But I hope you're well, you and your families and friends are staying safe and uh, have been finding exciting new ways to make audio during this time. Uh, this panel is about audiobooks, a kind of a vague description just says audiobooks um, so I thought well, what could I tell you as an audiobook producer mostly um, that might be of interest to you an audience of well, mostly narrators um, so I've got a whole list of things I thought I'd just kind of rattle through them and then when we get to the Q&A at the end you can pick up on pretty much any of those topics or anything else you may want to ask now bear in mind uh, I'm a producer I'm not the source client and this is a really important point because even though it may be people like myself hiring you we're not the source of the money uh, in the chain of events and that's kind of why the ACA was formed the ACA is a collaborative group of people who work within the audiobook industry uh, on the creative side rather than the publishers and the the people who pay the bills so uh, the person who basically originates the cash uh, we're everyone else we're the ones who get paid. That may well be that I get paid, then I pay you. Um, but the whole money side of the industry is a really interesting topic, and I'm going to come on to that in a little while. But I thought, first of all, uh, I just want to make a very important uh, point up front, which is knowing your value as a narrator, but also as technical staff is very important as well. Knowing our value during this recent time of upheaval where studios have had to close, people have had to invest in home setups, those who already had uh, home professional setups, uh, been able to hopefully increase their workload and step in and cover off where studios can't be open. It's really important to know your value and to know your value as a narrator uh, and I am talking about fees here, but I'm also talking about just your your importance within uh, the production of audiobooks. Because there are times when most of us can feel like we're almost an afterthought. And we really should never feel that way. Within audiobooks, the narrator uh, is key. You are the talent. You're the person who brings the author's voice to life. You're the person who creates the characters, gives them their voices, their tones, their characterization. And that's absolutely vital to everything we do. So I hope you never feel uh, undervalued by anyone you work with, particularly on my side of the microphone. Uh, but as a whole in the industry, understanding the role you play and your value is absolute paramount of importance. Um, and I bring this up because later on we're going to talk about the process. And one of the things I do think is very important uh, during the prepping process is the opportunity for narrators to speak either directly with authors or at least through the book's editor to get information and make sure that the end product is as good as it possibly can be and as close to what the author intended um, while still retaining the fact that it's a, a brand new iteration of those words. So let's have a look first off, I think importantly, at the process of making audiobooks. Uh, hopefully you've all had an opportunity to make an audiobook, but if you haven't, maybe you're here to uh, discover the process. You might be a commercial voiceover, um, or you may come from corporate world or from ELT, uh, but whatever, the basics of the audiobook process. So what we start with is a client, of course, and that's going to be a publisher. Now, that might be the direct publisher, someone like Penguin Random House, Little Brown, Orion, uh, or it could come through that behemoth that we all know, uh, Audible. Now, Audible don't generally create titles, although they do have an original production content 
team now, as you've probably seen with their original series, uh, their dramas, uh, their Alexa stories, all those things. But mostly what they do is they buy up rights for books from existing publishers uh, and directly from authors as well. And then they produce those titles. Uh, so they could be a client. So someone like Audible might approach uh, an external studio such as Labrick Audio and say, we've got this title, could you please have a look at it? Here are the details, here's the breakdown. And they ask us most times, and this is true of all clients, most times they'll ask us for suggestions for narrators, i.e. yourselves. I, as a producer, am asked to put forward two or three suggestions for a narrator. And so this is where my relationship with yourselves and with your agents is key. And we're going to get into that in a little bit. Once I've put forward those suggestions and the client has come back with who they want, uh, I'll come back to yourselves, either directly or through your agent, and we'll get you booked in. Then comes your first bit of work, uh, the dreaded prep. Now, it might be the simplest thing as just reading through the book a couple of times, making some character notes, making sure you know what your voices and accents, etc., are going to be, looking up a few dodgy pronunciations, and it quite, might be quite a simple, fast process, or it could be a very long, difficult one, uh, very involved with experts required and feedback. And the way I always work as a producer is I want you to come back and ask for help. Uh, so for example, I've got a little black book of experts who can help with specialist pronunciations, for example, language issues. Um, but also, and this is going back to what I was talking about earlier to do with knowing your value, is it isn't all on you. Prep mostly is an unpaid part of the process and it can be very complex. I believe, and the ACA believe very strongly, that as soon as you are contracted to produce an audiobook, uh, you have the right to request of the author via the client through the publisher and the producer uh, upfront information. And we've put together on the ACA website a prep sheet uh, which is there for your use completely for free. Um, and my recommendation is when you're contracted, uh, if you have a quick look at the book and you think it's uh, going to be quite complex, particularly anything that's got fantasy elements, uh, made up languages, uh, it may be a non-fiction book with a lot of very specific names or historical names and places. Uh, of course, a lot of that you can find yourself, but feel free to use this form, send it back and say as part of our process, uh, please, Mr. Publisher Man, uh, please either ask the author or the editor or someone within the publishing company uh, who is an expert on this book to feedback any pertinent information. With fiction, this could be something as important as how to not reveal who the killer is because of the accent that they may have uh, and other character traits, for example. But that's your prep moment, you've gone through that, then it's time to record. Now, there's two ways of recording. We have within studios where you come to us, for example, at Labrook in Croydon, and we'll record you, or you can work from home. Now, at the moment, pretty much everybody's working from home. Now, some people have very well-established home studios, uh, fully kitted out. Basically, it's a studio in their house, and I'm very jealous. Uh, some people recently, of course, had to improvise by using understairs cupboards, wardrobes, back bedrooms, duvets over their heads even. There are many, many ways of getting a recording done once you've got the basic equipment. But let's say you're coming to the studio. So you'll come to the studio for two, three days, however long the book requires. You'll work with us. We'll have uh, maybe four sessions across the day, morning, uh, and then a little break, and then later morning, and then lunch break, and then two in the afternoon. We'll always make sure you've got teas and coffees and you relax, and it's a nice environment for you to work with. In a studio, you're going to be working with a producer engineer. So that's someone who's going to be your first pair of ears. They're going to help direct you, give you feedback, make sure you're aware of uh, any mistakes you might have made. If you're working from home, you're pretty much going to be self-directing. Uh, there's two ways you can be doing that. You could uh, be just making mistakes and, and continuing on, and that's kind of chapter files. Um, and then that goes to an editor to be edited. Or you could do what's called rock and roll or punch and roll. It's various different names where when you make a mistake, you quickly go back and drop yourself in so that the final file uh, basically doesn't have any actual editorial errors and might just need a little bit of tidying up by an editor just to uh, smooth out some of the transitions. 
From the recording phase, the files go to be edited, uh, either by in-house editors or freelance editors, or you might choose to edit yourself if you're recording from home. Uh, that's a very important, um, technically skilled job. It requires knowledge of uh, obviously all the production elements, the technical spec of the clients, how files get mastered. But once that editing is done, or as those files are edited, it then goes to probably the most important uh, post-production phase, which is proofing. Now, proofers are incredible people, and I and the ACA feel strongly that we should support and praise our proofers in this country. Uh, there is a move towards using more automated proofing, particularly in America, which I'm sure has its role in faster paced production lines. Uh, but here in the UK, we really, really value our human proofers. They're a font of all knowledge, They're amazing people, and we probably don't pay them as much as we should, uh, and we certainly don't praise them enough. So these incredible people will listen to that edited audiobook, they'll compare it to the script, and they'll come back with a list of any errors, be they technical or editorial, pronunciation, uh, even intonation, uh, suggesting that something doesn't quite make sense and we'll take those uh, as producers and editors back or directly to yourself as narrator and ask for re-records of short little snippets just so we can drop those in and then do the final mastering which basically requires a little bit of post-production knowledge um, the knowledge of what tech spec your client requires be it Audible or Penguin Random House or Little Brown or whoever it may be or ACX or Find A Way uh, and then delivery. The files get delivered, uploaded via FTP or WeTransfer or direct via websites like ACX and Findaway. And the book is basically done. There may well be some metadataing and some other bits and pieces, forms to fill in. Um, but that is the process from kind of start to finish with, of course, one extra bit at the end, which is invoicing, uh, making sure that we all get paid. So if you're working through a production house, uh, we will get back to you or your agent will ask us to give a final duration so they can work out how much to invoice and you'll invoice us. We, at the same time on delivery, uh, have invoiced the client. Uh, and then somewhere within sort of 30 to 60 days after that, everyone gets paid, fingers crossed. Um, that's the plan anyway. So that's how the process of making audiobooks works. Um, obviously, it can get very, very complex, and I could talk for hours on each separate part of it. And this isn't really a tutorial. This is more just sort of a discussion, so you understand, as the narrator, what else is going on. From a studio perspective, which is mostly my experience, um, there are these other people in the chain. So you've got the producer engineer, you've got an editor, you've got a proofer. Uh, there may be a couple of other people, depending on the size of the organisation, of course, but a smaller company tends to be you know, a couple of people. Um, but all of them are key to working with you to bring that audiobook to life. And I love that process. I think it's fantastic to not just work with narrators, but work with skilled editors and proofers to really bring all that together. Uh, it's a real team effort, and it, it feels great when you get that review at the end of it. And it may well be that the review just says, this is a brilliant audiobook, but you know that all of you have been part of it. there is a very large range of books being produced. Uh, the market itself is quite, quite incredible. Um, roughly in 2019, uh, it's reckoned globally audiobooks are worth around about $3.5 billion, which is like, wow, that's a lot of money. In the US, which is the biggest market, about 75%, it's worth about $1.5 billion. But China is rapidly becoming a massive market as well, uh, with $1 billion worth of audiobook sales, uh, apparently, and that's growing. Uh, the UK, worth around about $85 million, uh, which is pretty good for such a small place, uh, and Europe as a whole is about $500 million worth. Uh, they reckon there's around about half a billion global listeners to audiobooks, which blows my mind. Uh, and somewhere around 46,000 titles per year being generated, which is incredible. I'm not sure if that's also including podcasts and short form material as well, but boy, that's a lot of audio going out into the world and being consumed and listened to and purchased. So it's amazing marketplace. It's absolutely growing and growing. And with digital technology, with Audible and Spotify and streaming services, with uh, Storytel and some of the other platforms, it really is just the time to get on board as a narrator for audiobooks. And this is really key because there's a lot of clients out there for you to approach. Uh, and it's not just through the production houses. There are at least two, if not three, basic ways for you as narrators to get into the audiobook game. 
The first is to approach the publishers directly, either yourself or through your agents. Uh, we'll talk about what you should supply in a moment. Secondly, there are the production houses, and there are quite a few of us out there, and we always appreciate knowing who's available, and what experience you have, and what voices you can bring, particularly what accents you can do, if you can do younger, older voices, particular uh, accents from around the world, or, or, or have any language skills. Uh, and then there's also the authors directly through these services, such as ACX. So you have three main ways to uh, get in to approach, and I would suggest going for all three if you can. It's laborious work, of course, and a lot of people aren't going to respond to you, but I can tell you from my experience, whenever I get uh, an email in from someone uh, just saying that they're available, uh, then that does get filed into a narrator's list, and it's something I'll go back to, because when I'm recommending uh, to my clients different narrators. Of course, I have people I've worked with a lot, people I know very well, people whose voices I know how to sell in and who will do a good job and what they cost. But I do always try and find new people uh, to offer up where I possibly can. And at the moment, of course, that's people with good, reliable home setups, but hopefully in the not too distant future, it's people who can travel down to our studios in Croydon and uh, have a good few days with us down there. So let's talk about what you should supply to someone like me when making an approach. So there's a whole world of demos, of course. There's a whole plethora of services and amazing people who can work with you on demo reels. And for audiobooks, it's interesting. One of the problems I've found over the years is when I do look on agency websites, there's very little audiobook specific demo on there. There will be a lot of commercial work, uh, but very little audiobook. And if there is, it's not the best. It's been recorded possibly on a home setup on a mobile phone, or it's a strange choice of, of audiobook. It's often quite bland uh, and stentorian and basic. Um, now, what should you provide? For me, what I'm looking for is a range of options from you. I need to know what you sound like doing non-fiction. I need to know what you sound like reading fiction. And then within fiction, I need to know what your narrator voice sounds like alongside character voices. So I need a bit of dialogue. So my suggestion is if you have the time, and pretty much we've all got some time at the moment, put together four or five two-minute, don't go more than two minutes, two-minute uh, demos. Do me a straight non-fiction read, try and find something historical or scientific so we can hear what you sound like imparting uh, information because non-fiction books are long and can get quite dry and tiresome and also there's a lot of complex language in there so I want to hear what you sound like doing non-fiction. Uh, then with fiction, a basic read. Pick a classic, but nothing too old-fashioned in its use of language, uh, something we recognize and give me two minutes of you just reading third-person narration. Then, sometimes, if it's the sort of book you like to do, uh, a fiction book which has first-person narration is a particularly handy trick. The one that fits well with your natural voice and tone and style. Uh, not necessarily something where you have to uh, fake a voice, as it were. Uh, who are you if you are the character narrating the book? And then fiction where we have narration alongside dialogue. We need at least two people talking to each other. We need to be able to hear the interaction between different voices, uh, whether that might be you're a, you're a female narrator doing male voices or male doing female, if it's young to old, old to young. It's really important to be able to hear how you transition between narration into dialogue, particularly two people having some kind of conversation or argument. Those things are really clear. If you can offer those, that's brilliant. Alongside that, if you have anything specialised you can do, so if you're particularly good with young voices, old voices, and as I say, any specialised accent work or language work, short demos of those are really helpful. And I find having two minute clips of those on MP3 format, something around 128K uh, will do fine. Mono, don't need stereo, we don't need music, any of that production stuff. I want clean, recorded, single voice work. I have those ready to go. Have them in a cloud drive in MP3 format so you can link to them or you can embed them in an email. Obviously have your agent put them on your website, or on their website, as well as if you have your own website. Direct people to those links. Uh, obviously, they're quite small files, so you can directly embed them into emails, but if you can link to a cloud service, a website, etc., then that's the best thing. If I'm casting for audiobooks, 
the worst thing is to be sent uh, a commercial reel. It doesn't help me whatsoever. I need to hear you reading an audiobook. So I hope that's handy for you. Uh, it sounds like a lot of work, but once it's done, it's, it's fine, you, you're, you're done. And then of course, as you record audiobooks later on, do ask the production house you're working with or the client to provide you with at least the first chapter file so you can take a clip out uh, and have that as a, a like, little library of uh, different books. That way if someone says, oh, have you ever done a kid's book before? You go, oh yes, I did this one, and here's a two minute clip from me doing it. So that's quite handy. Of course, once your audiobooks start going up on Audible, uh, uh, there'll be samples on there and you can always direct people to your Audible page, which is a really handy way of just getting a quick reply uh, if you're out and about and you don't have access even via cloud uh, to those specific uh, demos that you've recorded. So then let's talk money, fees. It's not really an area I particularly love getting into, but in my role at the ACA, uh, I have found that it is particularly important to bring this topic out into the open. Uh, there are quite a lot of misconceptions about where the money comes from and how it's divvied up. And uh, I've written a very long article and would be very happy to do a long talk, if necessary, about how money is broken down. Um, because there have been some feelings in the past that uh, particularly production houses are hoarding the money and not paying narrators as much as they are worth. And I have to say that's generally not true based on the source uh, amount that comes through to us. Uh, in fact, oftentimes uh, the production staff are, are the lowest paid people in the chain. Uh, but getting back to what narrators are worth, what are you worth? Is there an industry standard? Well, as we all know, there isn't. Uh, equity have uh, got guidelines, as have people like Gravy for the Brain, and those guidelines are very important to try to stick to. But of course, you all work for yourselves. Uh, your agents will have their own views on what you are worth. Uh, your experience should lead uh, to better fees. Uh, I would say, and this is my experience as a producer, I will never, ever offer less than £75 per finished hour. And what does per finished hour mean? That means per finished edited hour, the book, the final length of the book. It might have taken 15 hours to record a book, but once it's edited, it may only be 10 hours long. So your fee is based on those 10 hours, not the 15 hours that you took to record it. There are some people who charge a per working hour rate uh, and some people who charge a per day or per half day rate. All those are acceptable, but mostly it's worked out on a per finished hour rate. No one should be paid less than £75 per finished hour, in my personal opinion, and even that's quite low. Uh, there are some publishers who are moving up to a minimum of £100 per finished hour. There are some uh, that may ask you if you're self-recording and self-editing to do it at a higher rate because they're including the production, the direction, the editing. There may be some who are offering lower, uh, shockingly, uh, because they seem to not value home recording as much. Uh, it is your market. It belongs to you you get to set your rates. But bear in mind that what you set has an impact not only for yourself in terms of what you can charge later, uh, but also what the rest of the industry can earn and what those who are paying the bills uh, have an expectation of paying. So if you always, I would say as a beginner, start at 75 pound per finished hour as narrating only fee, not narrating uh, and editing or anything else, uh, that's a good starting point. Uh, go higher, of course, as you get more experience. Uh, do not be scared to ask, but also do not be shocked when some productions can't pay uh, ridiculously high fees, but some may. It all depends upon each production's individual budget. But start at that point and work your way up. Uh, £85 is about average for many people coming into a studio. Uh, home recording uh, can be a bit higher, depending on whether or not you're self-directing, self-editing. Uh, it's a complex piece of math. Um, but know your value. You are valuable, your talent is valuable, and everything you do is valuable. Um, so have those discussions, uh, but be aware of the bigger picture uh, and what you are offering, what you're putting out into the world for that fee. Finally, in this area, agents. Uh, 
Most of you are going to have an agent, hopefully, but some will represent yourselves. Do we mind one way or the other? Absolutely not. All we ask for is friendly interaction, timely replies to emails, uh, and an understanding of the market. The reality is, if we come to you and say, or to your agent, and say, this book has X budget, uh, we won't be lying about that. Audiobooks may be big business, but they aren't necessarily uh, massively well funded uh, and once you take out things like studio costs, producer costs, uh, editor costs, proofing costs, uh, then there's uh, still you know, a large amount is going to be left for the narrator. It's normally going to be about a third of the budget roughly, but be aware that this incredible growth in audiobooks hasn't necessarily been followed up by a increase in budgets. In some cases where publishers are actually making even more audiobooks than ever before, there's been a push down on budgets uh, because the excuse is that we're making more so we can't afford as much per title. But that's really it. Agents are fantastic people, love working with them, love negotiating with them and, and getting all the paperwork done. It's really handy people to have, but no, you don't have to have one to deal with us. There's no expectation on our part that uh, you have to be represented by an agent. Uh, as long as you can handle your invoicing and signing any contracts that need to be signed, um, then hey, that's great. I love working direct with narrators uh, and, and that's always a joy. So another area I'd like to talk to you about as narrators is promotion. Um, promoting yourselves, promoting the titles you work on. Now one of the things that m you may not be aware of is that um, most of the times when we as studios are working on titles we're working under a contract which normally has a stipulation about not revealing the title that we're working on until that title has become public knowledge. Normally public knowledge means it will go up on Audible as a pre-sale. So as though it might be really exciting to tweet from within the studio, hey look I'm recording XYZ with this narrator, we just can't do it. Um, and that's the client's privilege. They have a marketing and publicity campaign set out and uh, they don't want us kind of letting, uh, letting the word out too soon. Uh, and you may not be aware of that. So as, an, as a narrator, whilst it's incredibly important for you to promote the titles you've worked on and obviously promote yourselves through that promotion of the titles, be aware, check first on whether you're recording directly for a client or through a producer when you're allowed to socially share uh, the title you're working on. Now, that doesn't mean you can't do a tweet or an Instagram post or a Facebook post or something about being in studio. Just be careful not to reveal what the title is or what, who the author is. Uh, sometimes the author is revealing it actually and it's quite awkward. Uh, but just be aware that yes, share the excitement. Please do. We want the public and the listeners and the rest of the community to know that we're having fun in studios and booths and we're working and great stuff's being produced. But just double check that uh, you're not revealing a secret that shouldn't be revealed too soon. But do use social networking. I know it can be scary, but do use it. Twitter is a great opportunity to just share what you're working on. You don't need to share personal information, family photos, political opinions. You can just use it to say, hey, look what I've worked on. Share uh, the artwork from the title once it's gone public on, on Audible or the platform it's going to be sold on. Do any kind of behind the scenes little bits and pieces. It's a really interesting, exciting way of sharing it, particularly with the community as a whole, because you can follow other narrators, production houses, publishers, groups like the ACA and Equity, uh, and everyone will tweet and share and get involved. And it's really great when you get a review that you can share it up on there so we can all get involved and say well done. And, and also from a producer's point of view, I get to see who's doing what. It gives me extra knowledge of who's in the market, who's recording what sort of genre. Help promote the titles you worked on. This is going to be an interesting one actually thinking about this. It's something with my independent uh, publisher's hat on is something that proves difficult a lot of times, which is promoting titles we've paid to produce ourselves. Uh, it's great, I can do it and my company can do it, but when to get sales of books, narrators and authors going on social networking and banging that drum for us and putting the links up and getting excited, it's just worth its weight in gold. Um, now, of course, you may feel like, well, why should I do this? Because you're probably on a buyout deal anyway. Very few people ever nowadays get any kind of back-end deal uh, on any of the titles they work on. Um, yeah, sure. 
extra sales aren't going to mean anything to you directly in terms of money, but they will in terms of prestige. Um, and no, it's not one of those where you come and do something for free in return for uh, some kind of recognition. This is, you've already been paid, you've made the thing, be proud of it, help get the word out, help make it sell better, get it reviews, do everything you can so that the title gets bigger. Why? Well, publishers are going to love you for it, authors are going to love you for it, uh, producers are going to get to know you about, uh, know you better from it. It's really going to help your profile if you help promote the title when it's released. And every few months, don't be scared to go back and go, look at the thing I just did, here's a link. Or if you notice it's on sale somewhere, support that company. And if it's an independent audiobook publisher like ourselves at Spoken World uh, and some of the other amazing groups out there, or one of the charity groups as well, really help promote those because uh, the sales through the bigger platforms, obviously they take a massive cut of the money, uh, where sales directly through the websites of, of, of independent publishers uh, means we get to recoup a bit more of the cost of production. That means we can come back and hire you and we can invest in more rights and get more books out. And that's really like the cycle we need to get into. And with the charities, the more you can get involved in helping make sure people are aware of what's available to them and the resources are available, then the better. Because coming from you, you're the talent, uh, you're the voice of the book. So it, it really sounds great when you can get involved in doing that. Uh, which leads me actually onto my final point before we get to the Q&A, which is particularly at this moment, but once we're out of this scary time, building a community. Now, we've always been in the UK, uh, particularly a kind of a cottage industry. I don't like saying it that way because it feels a little disparaging. I don't mean it that way, but we all we can't kind of all get on with it ourselves. We all are aware of each other. Yes, we're all competing with one another. Uh, the studios compete with one another for, for work from clients. Obviously, the clients are competing with one another for who's got the biggest selling titles. Uh, the narrators are competing with one another to get our attention and to get the work and so on and so on. It's, it's a one big competition of people who mostly work in small teams or on their own. Um, interestingly, before this situation we're in came about, it was quite an isolated community. Yes, there are lots of studios out there, but it actually felt quite rare to meet other people within the community. Uh, and now, of course, we're all isolated. And uh, it seems like sort of 50% of our industry is coping very well because they always were isolated. Uh, and the other 50% are learning how to cope with it. Uh, interesting side effect, of course, is that those who are used to working from home alone a lot uh, have had to struggle with a different thing, which is working from home whilst there are people at home with them, because in the past their partners and would be at work and the kids would be at school, or, or, uh, and now they're, they're home with them and they're kind of making noise in the background and causing other difficulties, which is absolutely fascinating to look at and never expected something like that to, uh, to be an issue we had to deal with. But being a community, coming together, working together to raise all our voices uh, is really important. There's a lot of narrators out there, but there's also a lot of technical people. And if we come together and work together to make sure that those on the other side, on the publishing side, those who pay the bills and, 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 and come up with the cash and kind of drive the industry are aware of us as a whole rather than as competing tribes, this is really important. Why is it important? It's important because even though we each work for ourselves and we each compete to have the best pricing and the best delivery structures and all those different businessy things, if we all stand together and say, for example, no, there shouldn't be a narrator fee lower than £75 per finished hour. No, proofers are invaluable and should be paid a basic minimum of £15 per finished hour and editors shouldn't be asked to edit and proof and master and deliver for £20 per finished hour. It should be a minimum of £45 per finished hour uh, and that should be edit only. If we, if we join together and have technical people say on behalf of narrators, no, we will not pay them less than. And if narrators all say, actually, if you want me to do this, I'm going to hire an editor and it will cost X. And if we all say proofers are amazing, let's stand up and give them a, a massive round of applause because we love them. All these things come together uh, to help ensure that the entire industry is, is lifted up and, and we all get a little something better. Uh, for example, we've worked well um, to uh, ask the industry to include post-production credits for technical people. So you've always had narrators and now 
in the majority of cases, we're getting a credit for the producers and the editors, which is really important and there's a massive step change. Uh, we're looking at increasing fees for people. We're looking at things like the prep sheet to make prep a bit simpler uh, and a bit more streamlined. Uh, there are many things that groups like the ACA and Equity can work on uh, together. And so I reach out to you to say, please be part of the community. Please look to your fellow narrators, your fellow technical people, your studios, producers, composers, authors, everyone. Look around and not just at this difficult time when it's important to help each other out and reach out and do strange projects like the ABCs of audiobooks and this incredible conference. Not just now, but when things open back up again, don't let us fracture out again. Let us actually get closer together. So please do join the ACA. It's completely free. Be part of it. Get involved. Um, we're always looking for people on the working group to take a lead and get us involved with conferences and uh, information sources and resources. Um, obviously, equity is there for you as a union. Uh, there's other unions. Uh, if you're on the more technical side, you could look at BEC2, for example. Um, and there are other community groups, there are organisations like Gravy for the Brain and other training organisations that you can join up and be part of. And of course, there's social networking, uh, there's bulletin boards and chat rooms and a thousand other things. But let's bring it all together and work together. Um, I'm very happy to share my knowledge uh, as I have today. Uh, and if ever I can be of help, just reach out to us. And I'd hope you feel that you could do the same thing if someone needs your help, your expertise, your insights, or even literally just a connection to somewhere or someone else. Audiobooks are amazing. Coming into it as a narrator, there are a lot of key skills that you've probably already got from your acting experience, your VO experience, your commercial experience. Uh, one of the biggest things you're going to have to learn is the patience of sitting there for five, six, seven, eight hours a day, uh, how to cope with that stress, how to cope with how tiring it can be, uh, dealing with all the characters uh, and just the sheer length of time you're recording compared to maybe a shorter session for the commercial world. But you've got those skills. As long as you come in and be happy, cheerful, uh, proactive, enthusiastic, uh, you're going to be embraced and loved and work will come your way. It's not an easy industry, but it is a lovely industry and uh, I welcome all of you. So that's kind of the session. hope that's been okay. A little rambling, but it's a bit strange doing it pre-recorded. Uh, but I hope that's been useful.